you're producing like this really high quality food that is actually going to contribute to people's health uh, even more so than growing with the standard growing recipes that are available on YouTube and, and elsewhere that other migraines growers are uh, using. So by having this, you have like a level up. It's almost like a, a, a download of information, like in the matrix when, uh, when, when Neo gets uh, his download of how to do like Kung Fu, this is like a download of how to grow even better quality, nutritious food that people will actually have positive health impacts from. So. Welcome to the Mike Green's Mastery Podcast. I'm your host, Jonah Krokmalnik. Together, we'll explore the art of turning tiny seeds into a thriving migraines empire, sharing insights, coveted secrets, and strategic wisdom from building one of Canada's largest migraines farms. Stay tuned for thought-provoking conversations with leading figures in the world of microgreens. Welcome to the podcast, everyone. On today's AMA, we're going to touch on how much it costs to start a migraines business at home, best practices to remove sunflower hulls, to water or not during germination stage of growing, best practices to provide samples to restaurants, and so much more. There's a ton of great information in this episode, so let's get right into it. So the first question is, as someone growing microgreens at home, what is the best way to dispose of our seed sanitation solution without destroying our plumbing? So if you're sanitizing your seed with any normal agricultural chemical, um, even even household chemicals like bleach, which I don't recommend, but that's what some people do, um, hydrogen peroxide, vinegar, even rubbing alcohol, uh, none of those will destroy your plumbing. So as far as I know, there should not be any disinfection or sanitization solution that's used in agriculture that would destroy your plumbing. So I think you should be good. Uh, I wouldn't worry about it. Uh, it's not as as intense or as toxic to your plumbing or to you as you might think it is like things like bleach are definitely toxic to humans. It's not good to breathe it in. And even I've learned over the years in the early years of sanitizing trays by hand that even breathing in vinegar for a long enough period of time is, is really not good for you. I used to get headaches from <laughs> breathing in vinegar from the disinfectant solution when I was cleaning hundreds of trays in my basement. Um, so while it's not necessarily good to breathe in all the time, it's definitely not going to destroy your plumbing. So you'll be totally fine. I wouldn't worry about it. What size of sampler for restaurants is recommended? So this, this is a really good question. A lot of people will use a smaller container than they actually sell for samples. And I actually recommend giving the actual amount of product that you're going to sell. So if you bring a price sheet, and let's say all your products are in four ounce containers and you're giving like a two ounce container of your product as samples. Uh, sometimes, you know, chefs are, especially at restaurants, chefs are really busy and they, they may not even clue when they may think, oh, this is all I'm getting, um, especially if it doesn't have a label and say clearly that's two ounces. So I just highly, highly recommend people to just bring in full size clamshells of the products they're going to uh, want to sell to the restaurant. Um, so that's one option. I think that's the best option in my opinion, because then they know what they're actually getting. They can compare apples to apples with their current suppliers. Um, or if they're not carrying microgreens then they actually know what they're going to get, how many, roughly how many dishes it's going to serve. So that just makes it a lot easier, uh, as a salesperson trying to sell microgreens. The other thing you can do, uh, which I actually got this tip from the podcast episode with Bolly greens, where what they do is they have a, a cylindrical clamshell that has different compartments for different microgreens. So they'll put a bunch of different microgreens in those compartments. And then they, they have like a, uh, a flavor wheel Well, they'll say, okay, this, this flavor for this microgreen is spicy and, uh, goes well with this type of dish. And so it's just a way again, to make it easy for restaurants to understand where they can incorporate these greens into their menu. Um, so that, I think that's another great way to, to do it. Um, but generally speaking, I think it's best to have the full size product because then they know what they're going to buy. So it just makes it easier. Um, and then you could have the full size product and then have like a, a, a printed version of that flavor wheel, just explaining the different, uh, flavors. And then they can, they have enough product. They can actually test it out. So when you give a full size clamshell, let's say you're doing four ounces for restaurants, they actually can test out the product rather than just try it once. They can test it on a bunch of different dishes, see what works well. So it gives them more flexibility and you're adding a lot of value to them in the process and that they can try out different things and they don't have to 
uh, necessarily order when they're when they're not ready. So uh, it gives them more confidence and uh, puts uh, puts you as the grower in the front of their mind when they're ready to order microgreens, which sometimes is not always right in that moment. Sometimes it may be a few weeks later, a month later, a few months later, where they're actually ready to incorporate or change their menu. So um, I think that's the best way to to uh, give out samples. Next question is, what's the average initial investment of starting a one rack at home farm? So this is gonna vary depending on your local region. So if you're in Europe, it's gonna be different than in Canada, different than in the US. If you're in Mexico, it's gonna be different. So uh, roughly speaking, assuming that there's not any like crazy shipping charges or there's certain supplies you can't get, it should be roughly on the low end, like $600 US and on the high end, somewhere between 800 to 1000, depending on how much uh, you're purchasing. So for example, if you're just getting like one month's worth of seed and soil, it'll probably be closer to the, the lower end. If you're buying like, you know, a bunch of different varieties of seed uh, that can add up because when I, I bought seed recently to do testing at home, I think it was like just the seed alone to buy. I think I bought like 15 or 20 varieties, about one pound each. That alone was like $600 um, Canadian, but still. It, it, so it adds up when you're buying a lot of seeds. So it can vary a lot, but just for like the basics, the rack, the lights, the trays, the uh, base amount of soil, base amount of seed, you're looking at between 600 on the low end and a thousand on the high end USD to get one rack set up, which is actually really great because if you think about it, it's very practical to make once you get going $2,000 a month selling microgreens from one rack at full capacity. So it would take less than one month of operating at full capacity to pay for itself. So the return is really great. So while for someone that might say, oh, 600 to $1,000, that's not insignificant to me. The fact that you can pay it off so fast and start actually making money from it, that's where I think there's a unique opportunity there. Would mixing vermiculite into the soil accomplish the same goals as top coating trays? Um, so no, so the, the, that would be a different purpose. So. When you're top coating trays with vermiculite, what you're trying to do is uh, insulate the seeds and reduce mold growth on that top layer of soil where spores are going to constantly land just from being in the environment. So the vermiculite kind of stops that mold formation and gives a nice insulating blanket for your seeds. So it really helps with germination. Whereas if you're putting vermiculite into the soil, that's usually done to... Um, increase the water holding capacity of the soil so if you're using let's say this is a bad example but let's say using sand now you wouldn't want to grow in sand but let's say using sand sand doesn't hold much water if you've ever been to a beach like you know when the when the tide comes in it immediately just drains right through so it doesn't hold much water or even after a rain it doesn't take very long for sand to uh you know just disperse the water through and dry out versus soil which you know if you put water on sand, water on soil, the soil would hold it much longer. Um, so the vermiculite is an extension of the soil where it just holds water really well. So when you incorporate it in the soil, it increases the water holding capacity of the soil, which can be very valuable uh, for potting mixes that don't hold as much water or for um, uh, aeration also, because, because it dries out uh, and then create, because uh, of all the air space in the actual vermiculite itself, when it dries out, it creates more air space. So it, it does that as well, which is really nice. Uh, but generally speaking, for microgreens, you don't necessarily need to add it in um, to the soil. It's a better use case for vermiculite to use as a top coat. Um, you can add perlite, vermiculite to the um, peat moss or coir, but it's not something that's required to get a good growing medium. Next question is, what do you use to automate seeding trays? So I'll, I'll kind of go back in time. So I originally, when I started growing microgreens 10 years ago, uh, there really wasn't anything available to automate the seeding process, which as anyone that's growing microgreens knows that the seeding process is a time consuming uh, and very specialized task because you want it to be done well. Because if you, if you don't do a good job in spreading the seed out evenly, you're going to have pretty sub, subpar growth because you're going to have spots of like mold uh, and small leaves and then spots where it's like uneven growth because of uh, the lack of consistency in the seeding density along the tray. So <laughs> when I started, I had to do everything by hand. So I actually had to learn as most of uh, you know, migraines farms have to learn how to do it with the cup method and do it as evenly as you possibly can. 
And then the next thing I did was I created actually with my dad a, a vacuum seeder. So I did, I made it all by hand, which is really cool. I actually still have it. It's uh, uh, almost like a, a, a special memory in time of, of building this really cool uh, cedar. So pretty much what it is, it's, a, it's made of wood and then it's got a plexiglass top and I drilled literally thousands of holes in it uh, with specialized small drill bits so that seeds wouldn't get sucked through. And then there's an open uh, cavity at the bottom where you can put a vacuum hose in. So then you would turn the vacuum on, you would shake it, and then all the seeds would go in the holes. And then uh, you turn the vacuum off and then they fall into the tray. So this is called a vacuum seeder. I actually ended up buying uh, a better version of this later on. And uh, it works great, but it's very time inefficient and very laborious to like for one tray, shaking it, getting all the seeds off that are excess, uh, flipping it over, turning off the vacuum. Like it, it's almost not even faster. It's more accurate for sure, but it's not something I'd recommend for, for my greens. It was almost like an experiment. And then after that, the next thing I did was I bought a very expensive seeding machine that you can't even buy anymore. Uh, but it, the last time I checked, it was almost $24,000 US. So the, the story of how um, the little green seeing machine, which is what I do recommend people use for seeing trays because it's a much more cost effective option. It's like 10% the cost of uh, that commercial machine that I bought many years ago is I was doing consulting and uh, I was recommending this, this $24,000 seeding machine because there's farms that were like, we need to automate this process because we're scaling up and we need to figure out a way to automate the seeding because it's obviously a very important task for migraines. Um, and then all of a sudden this company stopped selling this seeding machine. And then there was absolutely not a single option for migraines farms to be able to um, automate their seeding process, which was kind of crazy because, you know, migraines have really become an industry. Now there's thousands and thousands of farms across the world and, uh, and these farms need way and these farms need a way to automate this process. So um, I, me and James from Vertigro, we initially were not planning to, to make the little green seeding machine. Um, it was, we weren't looking to make a manufactured product, but we saw that this is really needed. Um, so that's why we got into making it. So that's what I recommend. It should be out hopefully in the next month or so um, for people to, to purchase. Uh, and it's going to really revolutionize people's uh, operations in their migraines farm because they're going to get more consistent seeding. It's going to be super, super fast. You don't have to weigh out seed anymore. You'll be able to dial in how much seed goes in each tray without having to actually weigh the seed, which is a big deal. You can even do soaked pea seed, which is also a, a big deal, or soaked sunflower seed for people that soak those seeds. So it's really versatile um, and it's and it's very cost effective. So it'll, for anyone that's at any sort of scale in migraines, it'll pay for itself super fast. So definitely stay tuned for that. I'm really excited to uh, to have this go go out to farms and really uh, make farmers' lives a lot easier, uh, as, at least in in that process. And we'll have more products coming out in the coming years that will really revolutionize and help farms make their make migraines farms work a lot easier than it has been in the past few years. The next question is: I live in Texas. How can I find out if I can grow and sell from my home? So as much as I would like to provide this type of advice uh, directly, it, it, it's hard because it's different every single state, every single county, every single country. So what I recommend is calling or uh, reaching out to your local agricultural department. So the, in this case, agricultural department of Texas, you can tell them what county you're in. Uh, they may direct you somewhere else, but they can help guide you in where you can get that information. Uh, generally speaking, um, I've had quite a few people that uh, I've talked to in Texas, so I know there's something something along the lines of like a cottage cottage industry kind of law where if you're doing something from home and you're only selling in a certain area or a certain dollar amount, something like that, then you don't need to follow the the large scale regulations. So most places have something like that, like uh, like sm for to help small scale businesses start out, which is great, less regulation on them. Uh, but definitely check it out before you, you get into it. It's, it's always good to know what is required. And usually if there is anything required, it's usually pretty simple. For example, if there's like a food handling permit, like it's, it can be as simple as like a uh, one day online course or something like that. That's like very, very easy, very simple, all super basic. 
uh, things that it's not like, you know, calculus or anything like that. So it's definitely something that if there is anything you need to get, it's not going to be overly complicated. It's just they want to make sure that if you're selling food, that you're keeping it safe and making sure you're not doing things that are going to get people sick. That's really the, the point of, of those type of laws. Next question. I noticed the local growers sunflower shoots still had seeds on them in the health food store. Overall, how clean should the product be with respect to presentation, but also balancing your labor and time cost? Yeah, this is a, a great question. <laughs> At the beginning, when I was growing sunflower, I like literally took off every single seed. And um, it was only in the later years. So pretty much I stopped growing sunflower because I, I couldn't figure out a way to uh, efficiently grow it to not spend hours taking off seed hulls. Uh, of course, I figured that out later on, which is great. So we started regrowing it and it actually became one of our most popular products. Um, but for, I, I totally understand where this question is coming from. And it, the, the answer is it needs to be clean enough that like, or, or have a, a few enough shells that maybe there's one, two, maybe three in a clamshell. Like that, that's a good indication that it's not excessive. If you have like, if you, if someone op uh, like goes to a store, looks on the back of the clamshell and sees like 20 C's just hanging out there, um, it, it, you know, it, it's not a clean product. It's not something that is giving off the essence of quality and, and quality control. So having a few seed hulls in there is not a big deal. Um, you know, I would say one to three is a good range. So if you're packing your clamshells and you're seeing that there's like more than that, then maybe you need to go back in the process and remove some more of the, the hulls. Uh, the best way to do that, honestly, is uh, a few things. One, seed selection. So having a high quality seed makes a huge, huge difference. So um, I've had batches of seed where like you can grow it perfectly, but the hulls just won't come off. And it's something with the seed that the way it was grown. So I always recommend if you find a good batch of sunflower, buy a lot of it. Um, and then you you have you don't have to worry about that for a long, long time, which is really great. Um, so that that's the first thing. The second is having a strong enough light source, uh, I found makes a big difference too. So if you're just growing with one light and you're having trouble getting your sunflower hulls to come off, try increasing it to, to two or three lights, especially three. That's what I really recommend. And because it's giving more energy to the plant. And then, you know, the light is the plant's energy. That's photosynthesis. So if it has more energy, it has more strength to pop off the shell. And I've noticed it can make a, a big, big difference, which is probably why if you plant sunflower seeds outside, you won't have the same issue of shells sticking for as long because um, they're getting, assuming you're doing it in like the summer months when the sun's pretty strong, it'll have more energy to pop off that shell. Um, and then the third thing, which I didn't personally do, but I know a lot of growers do, is they'll like mist uh, um, the top of the hulls or the canopy of, of the crop on a daily basis and then kind of brush them off. Um, I found this was kind of not needed. If you get a good quality seed, you have enough light and you have a good washing regimen. So we had a bubbler, which is actually really cool. Now, um, I saw farmer's friend just released a, a like a, a package system for a bubbling system for your greens. So this, this will work great for anyone that's growing a lot of sunflower. I don't think it's necessarily cost effective unless you're growing like a good amount of sunflower, but it's a great out of the box solution, uh, for anyone, um, looking for, uh, a way to wash your sunflower effectively. So definitely check that out. Uh, no affiliation, just love what Farmer's Friends doing. They got some great, great products. So definitely check that out. Uh, they also make the Quick Cut Greens Harvester, which I always recommend. Uh, now there's a second part to this question, which is uh, that they're noticing broccoli and radish is having some hulls, shells hang around uh, and kind of any advice on that. So uh, with the brassicas especially, I don't worry about the seed hulls, like any sort of small seeded variety. Um, the hulls are almost like very thin. So even if you, even if they're in the product, it's not something that is going, you're like when you bite in a sunflower seed, like you're like, like it's not a pleasant experience. It's almost like wood. Um, when you bite into a broccoli hull or a radish hull, you won't even notice, honestly. Um, so I wouldn't worry about those, those kind of hulls. I would just, uh, uh, let them let them be and let them be in the packaging. Uh, not an issue at all. Now there's some like cilantro that there's mixed reviews. I personally, we never took off the hulls. They actually have a really nice flavor because they're coriander seed. So if you get a good quality seed, it usually has a very nice, pleasant flavor. And restaurants actually like that. Uh, we only had one or two times where people were like, "Oh, 
uh, we don't want the product with with holes on. Uh, but the vast majority of the time, no one really cared. But I know that there are some people that have that uh, concern. Um, so with things like cilantro, then there are techniques that you can do to get the holes to come off uh, by putting weight down, longer period of time of weight on the trays and then covering it with soil or vermiculite before watering them in the germination stage. And that will significantly reduce the amount of hulls that come out. So for something like cilantro, you probably want to keep them for seven days uh, with weight. And then most of the hulls will come off from that. Next question, since microgreens are already very nutritious, is it possible to grow even more nutrient dense plants with the goal of having superior products, especially if I plan to grow it for personal consumption and for families? So yeah, for sure. Um, so most microgreens are grown without fertilizer. And uh, I talk about this so much that I feel like I'm a broken record, but I know there's always new people um, that are listening. So uh, if you don't have fertilizer, then the plant only can absorb what's in the seed and that's it. So you have a maximum level of nutrition, which is would be the same as eating the seed, except of course, like vitamins can be produced and the, the, there will be more activity, more enzymes and all that stuff. So like a sprout, it's going to be more nutritious than the seed because there's more bioavailable nutrients in there. Um, and then a microgreen is going to have more than a sprout because it's grown for a longer period of time. But if you don't have any fertilizer in the soil, what is the microgreen consuming? And all it's consuming is what's in the seed. And it makes a massive difference to have fertilizer in your soil. Um, there's so much bad information on this online that uh, has just been spread over the years and I really want to help people uh, access the truth with this uh, because it makes such a big difference for the product quality you're selling. And like, you know, you're selling a superfood. If, if you want to get as much super in the food as possible, um, you don't want to be selling like the lowest quality superfood. Um, you know, if, if anyone's ever had matcha tea, there's different grades. There's like, they call it like a ceremonial grade, which is the highest quality. It's the first harvest of the leaves. It's the highest quality matcha you can buy. It's much more expensive, but it's it's much higher quality. And then there's uh, you know second grade and third grade uh, matcha, which is like later on harvest. So the plant's more stressed. It's not producing as much of the uh, flavonoids and all, all the good stuff that you want in uh, the the matcha. And uh, you can taste it. If you've ever had ceremonial grade matcha versus like a second or third grade matcha, it is a massive difference in quality and flavor. Like I honestly, like if there's poor quality, like matcha, I won't even drink it because it's just not even really the same thing. And the same thing with microgreens. If you um, try a microgreen that's grown the traditional way, which is no fertilizer, one to two lights, um, grown in, yeah, just like those conditions and you compare it to growing in the super soil recipe with high quality fertilizer growing with three lights using high quality seed and you compare the flavor of those two it's like night and day it's it's not even comparable which one makes your sales easier you're gonna get higher yields because of that and most importantly you're actually selling a superfood in that scenario um you're 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 producing the highest quality food you possibly can with the current available information and uh, and, and what's cool is that it'll always get better over time, which is great. Um, so you're, you're producing like this really high quality food that is actually going to contribute to people's health uh, even more so than growing with the standard growing recipes that are available on YouTube and, and elsewhere that other microgreens growers are uh, using. So by having this, you have like a level up. It's almost like, uh, you know, it's almost like a, a, a download of information, like in the matrix when, uh, when, when Neo gets uh, his download of how to do like Kung Fu, this is like a download of how to grow even better quality, nutritious food that people will actually have positive health impacts from. So I think it's really, really powerful. And, uh, and the way you do that is, uh, the number one is by having a, a good quality soil. And that comes down to using the super soil recipe, which is um, using a peat moss and the Gaia Green fertilizer. And you can find the recipe on our, on our website in our growing guide. You can download it completely for free. Um, and the reason it's for free is because I want people to start growing this way because I know that the impact it'll have on people's health is tremendously valuable, um, not only um, to you as a business owner, but obviously the people that are uh, consuming this food, uh, you know, that, that's your goal. And I think a lot of people are not fully aware of how different a microgreen is from another microgreen. So 
part of my goal is just create that awareness. And once people have that awareness, they'll make the decision to grow what is most uh, beneficial for their business, but uh, even more so more beneficial for the health of their customers. The next question is, can the Super Soul recipe be certified organic? So yes. So the, the standard Super Soul recipe that's in our growing guide is using ProMix HP. So the reason that I recommend that is because it's the most easily accessible soil um, that is of high quality. So ProMix MP is the organic version of that. There's actually also a uh, organic HP, but it's not easy to find just yet. Uh, it's still not common. I'm hoping it will be more common. Uh, but right now, if you if you just switch out the HP, the ProMix HP for the ProMix MP, then the super soil can be a certified organic soil if you decide to go down the route of getting certified organic. So super simple. Uh, the only switch the fertilizer is already uh, certified to be organic. And those are the only two components. So it's a super simple recipe and makes a big difference. So definitely recommend anyone listening to, that hasn't tried it out to try it out because it will make a massive difference in your profitability uh, because your yields are going to be higher in the quality, meaning that your customers are going to have more nutritious product and it's going to taste a lot better. So they're going to want to buy it more often. What do you feel was the most difficult part about learning the business part of selling microgreens? This is a really good question. And obviously this is a, a more of a personal one because everyone's going to have a different perspective on this. For me, I started my business when I was 23. I was, I was a kid. Um, and for me, I was super shy. I was very introverted. And the hardest part was honestly just reaching out and trying to uh, like get sales. So I started out, I was, because I was super shy, and introverted, I would just email customers. I would just like cold, send cold emails be like, hey, I'm a Mike Green's grower. Uh, um, I, I would love to work with your restaurant and have you carry my Mike Green's. And, you know, I got a few people responding, but it, the success rate was pretty low because like you're trying to sell a food product through the, uh, you know, through emails to someone that you've never met, that you haven't built a relationship with. It's a lot harder. Not doesn't mean it can't be done. Like, uh, you know, there's, you could definitely sell microgreens through Facebook groups is, is a much better way to do it as an example, because you can make it more personable than an email. Um, you can share it to more people at once. So it's a much more efficient way of doing it than just sending an email uh, directly to a restaurant sort of thing. But for me, it was getting over the discomfort of selling, uh, just selling is the simple way to put it. So there was, there was a big fear of like, am I going to be able to do this? Uh, you know, what if people say no? What if I can't get enough sales? There was all these kind of dialogues going on in my head that uh, prevented me from really going forward faster. So I would say that slowed down my growth the first few years of starting the business because I was just like, I just, I love the growing side of things, but I wasn't super fond of selling. So it took a while for me to get comfortable with that. Um, but once I did, once I started having some success, I was able to build a lot of confidence and build upon that and just have it like compound, compound, and then pretty fast. It goes from like, you know, really slow steps to really fast steps in progressing with sales once you get more comfortable. So it's really just getting over that hump. Um, and the best way to do that is just practice and just going in without the expectation that you're gonna sell something, just to learn how to sell. Uh, I wish I had that mindset when I started. I think I would have progressed much faster on the sales side of things. So I hope that helps you on the journey. So the last question is, some farmers don't water at all during germination and some do. What approach is best in your experience? So this will depend on uh, many different factors. But generally speaking, if you can get away with not watering German, during germination, I'd recommend doing that um, because you're going to save time. So it, it's really about can you get away with doing it and still have a high quality German, germination. So if you can, then you want to skip out on watering during germination. If you can't, then you have to water during germination. And there's ways to uh, change your recipe to have yourself not have to water as much during germination or if at all. And one of those things could be top coating the seed with soil or vermiculite because it's an insulation, uh, a moisture and temperature insulation uh, to the seed. So in theory, uh, especially with a small variety seed, if, if there's if there's a seed that's like two or three days in germination, and it's a small variety of seeds, so it's like a broccoli, a kale, radish, those type of seed, you shouldn't have to water during germination. You should be able to um, 
plant the seed, top coat it with uh, ideally vermiculite, water it in, and that vermiculite will provide that moisture to the seed over the next few days so that you don't have to water it during that germination period. So in my opinion, just for that alone, it's worth it to use uh, vermiculite, but there's also all the other benefits that come with it. Now for the bigger seed varieties, if you are soaking peas in sunflower, you can get away doing the same thing by using vermiculite. If you're not soaking them, which is what I did, because it's it was just one less step, you probably have to water them at least once during germination because of how much water, especially uh, peas, they soak up so much water, the seeds almost double in size that you need to be providing that water source in some capacity. So if you're soaking the seed, you've already saturated the seed with water, so you can get away with not watering during germination, especially if you're using a top coat of vermiculite. If you're not, there's a few things you can do. You could put a really thick layer of vermiculite on, but that can get expensive, but you can do that and then provide that moisture to the seed. You can also uh, water the trays of pea shoots more thoroughly. So they're not saturated, but closer to than you would, let's say a tray of broccoli or uh, kale as an example. But uh, the challenge is, is that, you know, you don't want to oversaturate the trays because you can reduce or you can increase the risk of mold and poor germination. So there are some balancing factors, but for most crops, all the small seed varieties, you should be able to get away with uh, only watering once at the beginning and then waiting for the seeds to germinate. If there's something, let's say like a cilantro that you're doing six or seven days in germination, you're probably not going to want to leave it that long without watering at least once. So if you're top coating with vermiculite, I'd probably just do it once at the halfway mark just to give it some fresh moisture um, and, uh, and make sure that there's enough moisture for those seeds to germinate. So th that's what I recommend. Uh, I like it would be different depending on different crops. If you want to do like across the board and just keep it simple, then I would just say water, uh, a very light watering every day to keep it simple if, if you want to do it that way, but it's more work. So for me, when you, once, you, once you start growing hundreds or potentially thousands of trays, uh, it makes sense to optimize for each crop because it'll save a lot of time. But if you're doing like, you know, two trays of broccoli and 10 trays of, of pea shoots, it might make sense just to have a, across the board uh, uh, protocol that just keeps it simple. So it just depends on where your business is at and what makes sense. Because as you get bigger, it makes sense to, to optimize uh, specifics because it can save a lot of time and create a lot of efficiency in your system. So I hope that helps. I hope uh, uh, the answers to these questions help you along your journey in growing your microgreens, uh, whether you're doing it as a hobby or as a business. And we'll see you in the next episode. Thanks so much. Thanks for tuning in to the Microgreens Mastery Podcast. To access a wealth of insights, just click the subscribe button, stay notified about each new episode, and enjoy all of this wisdom for free. If you're ready to supercharge your microgreens business, visit microgreensconsulting.com for a gold mine of guides and resources. We've transformed thousands of microgreens businesses, and you're invited to join the success story. Let's stay connected. Follow us on YouTube, Instagram, and TikTok at Microgreens Consulting for exclusive content and expert tips and wisdom. If you found this episode insightful, please leave us a review, spread the word, and let's share microgreens magic with the world. Until next time, let curiosity fuel your growth and may happiness be your harvest. Happy growing, everyone.